I had just arrived home on Friday and was eagerly anticipating the weekend. My wife greeted me differently, not with her usual smile and peck, but appearing fidgety and determined about something. It seemed like something was off. I greeted her and inquired about the kids, expressing that it was Friday and they should be home. She informed me that the kids were with mom until Monday and expressed an urgency in her voice, saying she needed to talk to me. She mentioned having something to tell me, acknowledging that it might be tough for me to grasp. She assured me it wasn't something negative, but might be challenging to understand initially. She asked me to try to understand if I loved her. I agreed to try to understand, and she thanked me, stating that it was something that had been on her mind for a long time and might sound silly or strange at first. She then revealed her desire to be fornicatory with others, and despite my initial laughter, she conveyed seriousness. I questioned if she was divorcing me, but she reassured me that she loved me and would never leave me. She emphasized that this was something she felt she needed to do. As she explained her desire to explore beyond our marriage, anger replaced my initial shock. I expressed my lack of understanding and disagreement with such a decision. She insisted that she was going to do it whether I liked it or not, clarifying that she had never cheated on me and had no intention of doing so. She assured me that she had promised to take precautions and not deny me anything in our bed. However, I wasn't fully present in the conversation, and she noticed my mind was wandering. She emphasized that this had nothing to do with us and made it clear that it was a personal need she felt compelled to fulfill. Despite her pause, I remained motionless and unresponsive. I just sat there staring, appearing to be all but catatonic. My wife of 17 years had just destroyed me and expected me to actually like it, or at least tolerate it. I didn't, and I wouldn't, not ever. Veronica, my wife, expressed her need for this change, explaining that she was getting to a stage in life where she really needed it. She shared her history of being a maiden when we married and how she had never known another man. She emphasized her desire to explore and understand lovemaking, clarifying that it was only about the physical aspect, not love, except with me. I continued to stare, unable to say anything. The revelation that my wife wanted to explore other men not just one but multiple, was deeply unsettling. The most shocking part was that she expected me to be okay with it. Veronica urged me to say something, but I couldn't find the words. Instead, I rose and headed upstairs to the bedroom, the one that had been ours. Now it meant nothing to me. I felt sick and broken spiritually, my body devoid of sensation. I was overwhelmed with fear. In a remarkably short time, perhaps 15 minutes or less, she had managed to destroy our marriage. I sat on the bed contemplating, or rather, attempting to contemplate. I knew I had to leave the house and distance myself from my wife, a wife who was on the brink of betraying me, and she was determined to proceed, regardless of my feelings. I had been an avid marathon runner in college. Running or taking long walks always helped me clear my thoughts. I decided to walk, to walk for a long distance. I changed out of my suit and into comfortable jeans, a Henley shirt, and my dollar two hundred running shoes. Grabbing my wallet, a cap and sunglasses, I descended the stairs. Veronica remained seated in the same spot where she had disclosed her intentions to explore closeness encounters with other men. I paused for a moment, gazing at her. Once again, she felt like a stranger to me. Glancing back at her, my hand on the doorknob, I asked who she was. I turned and exited slamming the door shut behind me. As I briskly moved forward, her words were drowned out as I shut the door forcefully. I was already past the neighbor's house when she called for me to return and talk. She caught up, running alongside me until she ran out of breath. She continued to plead, expressing that we needed to talk, and she loved me. She assured me that she wasn't doing this to hurt me and emphasized that there was still an us. She professed her love and pleaded for me to come back, she eventually gave up. I think she collapsed on the sidewalk, but I didn't glance back to confirm. I couldn't bear to look at her. She couldn't keep up with the pace I was setting. I could still complete a marathon in under three hours without breaking a sweat. Soon, I was two blocks away, and she was nowhere in sight. Turning the corner, I accelerated, going into overdrive as I called it. I was cruising. I could maintain this pace indefinitely and perhaps I would. We had met in college. She was distributing cups of water to participants in a 10K event. I had won that race. 
Later, I joked with her that I had won because I was racing to find her before she slipped away. I caught her just in time, before she disappeared into the crowd of spectators. We hit it off instantly. She worked as a secretary to the dean of the business school. Despite not finishing college, she had secured a significant job due to her meticulous attention to detail and adeptness with written communication. I was a graduate student at the time, studying electronics and computer science. We dated for six months before becoming fornicatory, and it was incredible. Despite being a maiden, she was exceptionally skilled in matters of closeness, and she thoroughly enjoyed it. At the time it didn't occur to me, but she was naturally enthusiastic. There were signs. She just never fully embraced it. We married months after my graduation, and 14 months after we first met. I was 26, and Ronnie was a year older at 27. Yes, I'll repeat it. She was still a maiden at 27. Callie and John Jr. arrived in the ninth and 10th years of our marriage, respectively, and we thrived. Ronnie continued as the dean's secretary, and I worked as a computer systems engineer for Peters Limited, a company involved in cutting-edge military research and development. My boss and the owner of Peters Limited was Bill Schuler, a 60-ish bachelor with an almost manic work ethic. Bill and I were not just boss and employee, we were close friends. Veronica and I had been married for about 17 years now, which I had believed to be wonderful. However, evidently, Veronica thought differently. Over the past few months, Ronnie had become somewhat distant, occasionally short-tempered with me, and less frequently, with the children. This had led to a couple of heated arguments. While being short with me was one thing, I couldn't tolerate it when it came to the children. I considered that she might be going through menopause. I wasn't well-versed in female biology but I was aware of some things. I had intended to look into it more but I never got around to it. Now as I walked, I wished I had. Veronica explained to Roberta that she didn't know where Bobby, her brother, was. She mentioned that he had left the house around 5 p.m. on Friday and hadn't been seen since. Expressing her worry and frantic state, Veronica sought guidance from Roberta, expressing concern about Bobby's whereabouts and asking for help. Roberta Mason could have been my wife's twin, and they had more than once been mistaken for sisters. Both had flowing red hair, curvaceous figures, and adorable freckles. Roberta was maybe an inch taller than Ronnie at 5'7", but otherwise, they were near clones of each other. However, Bobby had a different personality. She was tough-minded, slow to speak, and less inclined to do so, still single at age 40. No, she wasn't gay, but she preferred being independent. Roberta Mason inquired about John, expressing surprise that he would behave in such a manner. Veronica shared that they had a disagreement, and John had walked out without talking. Bobby, concerned about the situation, reassured Veronica that Ronnie, presumably her husband, would find John. However, Bobby wanted to know the details of their argument, to which Veronica responded vaguely, stating it was personal and nothing that should have led John to leave. Roberta, a psychologist, commented on the situation, expressing her intention to find out more when they located John. She noted that Veronica had waited too long to call, hinting at sarcasm. Despite their good relationship, Roberta always felt that Veronica was a bit ditzy. Roberta then asked for details about John's departure, including the direction he headed, his clothing, and if he had taken a coat or his car. Veronica provided information about John going east toward Baxter, wearing a dark green t-shirt, jeans, and a Cubs baseball cap. She mentioned that he hadn't taken a coat or his car, expressing concern about the freezing weather. Roberta acknowledged the urgency of the situation and instructed Veronica to stay home and man the phone in case John called. She assured Veronica that she had her cell phone and would keep her informed as she set out to search for John. The road was icy, so Roberta Mason drove under the speed limit. Ten miles out of town, her cell rang, prompting her to pull over to answer it. She learned that John was in Baxter, and expressing concern, decided to head there immediately before hanging up. In Baxter, a town of 150 with few residents, John found himself indifferent to the place, enjoying a hot meal and warmth in his cell. The steel door at the end of the hall clanged open, and although John couldn't see who was coming, the footsteps signaled someone approaching. As the only prisoner, it had to be him. Upon arrival, Roberta questioned John, asking if he was proud of himself. He inquired if Veronica had called her, and Roberta confirmed, 
revealing that she had already been on the road looking for him. She expressed concern about his actions, pointing out that he had little ones and a worried wife at home. John sarcastically remarked that the kids might be worried, but Veronica wouldn't be. Roberta acknowledged that Veronica hadn't provided much detail, only mentioning a tiff and John leaving. John explained the disagreement, revealing Veronica's intention to be fornicatory with other men, whether he liked it or not. Roberta's face remained composed as John elaborated on Veronica's plans. The guard sympathetically opened John's cell door, and they walked toward the front receiving area. John was informed that he had been bailed out, but needed to return by Friday to plead. The jailer advised him to pay the fine and settle the damages for the bar fight, which involved broken chairs, a damaged table, and a broken mirror. John agreed, acknowledging the logic of the advice. During the two-hour-plus drive back, Roberta questioned John about the bar fight. After he shared his story, she remained silent for some time and then began her analysis. As John's sister, she considered herself his patient and insisted on helping him, noting that women go through changes men can't understand, attributing it to hormonal factors that can induce fear and insecurity. I conveyed to Bobby that I wasn't naive, emphasizing that other women don't engage with other men to improve their situations. I spoke with conviction, asserting my position. Bobby countered, sharing a statistic that 60% of men and 40% of women engage in extramarital affairs, contributing to the high divorce rate. She suggested that Veronica might be going through such a phase and needed my support. As I started to respond, she raised her hands to stop me. She clarified that she wasn't advocating for letting Veronica be fornicatory with other men. Instead, she urged me to talk to her, hold her hand, and guide her through this challenging period. Bobby emphasized that Veronica needed my strength and support. I expressed my willingness to do anything to help Veronica, with the condition that if she allowed another man to be fornicatory with her, our relationship would be over without any exceptions. I made it clear that if she disrespected me in that way, I would do my best to bring consequences to both her and her lover or lovers. Bobby fell silent again, and I felt uneasy, perceiving her thoughtfulness as judgment. The conversation then shifted to lighter topics. Observing my accomplishment of walking a hundred miles in two days, Bobby acknowledged it. I downplayed it, saying it was something I could do and needed the time for introspection, dismissing it as nothing significant. It was a hell of a feat, especially given the temperatures and road conditions at this time of year. What were you thinking? She said. She meant, how could I not have thought about the conditions of the weather and the roads? but I extrapolated her words to mean my thoughts about Veronica, myself, and our marriage. Christmas was three weeks away, shaping up to be quite the holiday. What awaited me under the yet-to-be-put-up tree? Perhaps a used contraceptive, bearing someone else's seed. I felt furious, and couldn't bring myself to go home just yet. I instructed Bobby to drop me at Peter's, explaining that it was Sunday, and I needed to be alone for a while. I suggested that she could go there tomorrow, and inform Veronica about my need for solitude. Bobby expressed her understanding and mentioned that she would talk to Veronica who was quite worried about me. She speculated that Veronica might reconsider her plans, if any, now that she was aware of my feelings. I assured Bobby that I wouldn't do anything rash and just needed more time to think. After dropping me off, I watched Roberta drive away before entering my office. Although she believed Veronica might postpone her plans, I couldn't shake the concern that she might have already acted on them. Reflecting on the loss of trust in my wife, I considered it a significant and troubling situation. He's afraid he's lost you, Roberta commented upon entering, shrugging off her coat without a greeting. Veronica dismissed the notion, stating that she had told me he would never lose her. Roberta challenged her, emphasizing that when she mentioned making love to other men, any man would be thinking what I was thinking. Veronica, looking troubled, asked if I had told Roberta. Roberta confirmed, stating that she was my sister and that secrets like that couldn't be kept for long. Veronica defended her desire to explore, framing it as something she had always wanted to know about and considered okay to do. Roberta issued a warning, stating that if Veronica went through with it, she would lose me, our children, and most of the friends and relatives who loved her. She emphasized the gravity of the situation, questioning if Veronica realized the consequences. Veronica couldn't meet Roberta's eyes as she explained her need, 
hoping that Roberta would understand. She revealed that it had consumed her for a long time, expressing uncertainty about being able to help herself. Veronica emphasized that John had always understood her and needed him to do so again. She acknowledged that she couldn't live without him, but was unsure if she could refrain from acting on her desires with someone else. Expressing the real danger of outright cheating, Veronica admitted that the overpowering feeling and need inside her were challenging to resist. Roberta, in response, shared her perspective, stating that she could relate to such overpowering feelings. She explained that despite loving men and not being gay, she chose not to marry because she knew she couldn't remain faithful to one man. She cautioned Veronica about the potential consequences of her proposal, emphasizing the risk of losing everything if she didn't clean up her act soon. Veronica conceded that Roberta might be right, and she started to sob. Roberta comforted her, assuring her that everything would be all right. She offered to stay with Veronica for the night and promised to be there the next day when John returned, ready to referee the situation. Roberta expressed gratitude for Veronica's acknowledgement and advised her to give up the idea of being with other men. She emphasized the importance of convincing her husband that he had nothing to fear, recognizing it as a challenging task. Veronica nodded, allowing herself a small smile, though Roberta missed the slight narrowing of her eyes in response to the last words. Realizing that obtaining her husband's approval was unrealistic, Veronica faced a decision either abandon her plans entirely or persuade her husband otherwise. These were two distinct choices, but her priority was winning him back, as her love for him remained undeniably true. For the first time since his abrupt departure, Veronica felt a sense of clarity. Answers were within reach. She would soon find out. The following morning, I woke up on the office couch feeling a bit stiff. The lengthy walk and less-than-ideal sleeping conditions had taken a toll. While accustomed to marathon distances for time, military-style endurance walks were a rarity for me, especially in the last decade. Yet, I was somewhat proud that I hadn't lost my touch. Not yet. I parked in front of the house a little after 10 a.m., knowing Callie and John Jr. would be at school. Veronica opened the door, embracing me tightly. Her relief at my return was palpable. My wife expressed relief, assuring me that she was no longer worried and asking me to forget everything she had said earlier. She admitted to being an idiot and mentioned having a conversation with Bobby, who helped her understand. I remained cautious, my suspicion lingering, as she seemed to have abandoned something she adamantly refused to discuss just a few days prior. I acknowledged her statement with a guarded response, hoping she meant it. Entering the kitchen, I noticed Bobby sitting at the table, sipping her tea. I greeted her and questioned if she was there to support my wife's story. Bobby confirmed that they had talked extensively and expressed hope that we could get through the situation, describing it as a dumb female head trip. Despite the reassurances, something felt off, and I found myself in quite a predicament, lacking trust in my wife. I nodded, hesitant to take anything for granted despite Bobby's insight. She hadn't witnessed or heard Veronica like I had during the Friday confrontation. Over the next few days, Veronica worked hard to reassure me. I was almost starting to buy into Bobby's explanation of a dumb female head trip. Then came Thursday, a peculiar phone call with background noises. I didn't mention it to Veronica but figured out the words, call, cell, call, my cell. Upstairs, I found her cell on the dresser, checked the call history, noted six unknown numbers, and felt lucky. With my military background, I knew uncovering the identities behind those numbers would be easy. Illegal, yes, but my boss had used his clearance for a similar situation. It had been a year. Now it was my turn. This wasn't a no-fault state. If I caught her with evidence, she was mine. Feeling confident that night, the lovemaking was more than good. She had certainly turned things around in the past six days. I hoped I wouldn't have to give it up anytime soon. Arriving early in the lab, I aimed to catch Tim before he headed into the field. Tim, our systems installer and field techie, shared a camaraderie with me, fueled by numerous brews as we cheered for our alma mater, Ohio State. I called out to Tim as he passed by, asking if he had a minute. He halted on his way out and agreed to come into my office when I mentioned having a problem and needing his help. In my office, Tim settled into a chair, and I took a seat beside him. I brought up the incident from last year, when Mr. Peters had him do some snooping. Tim became suddenly attentive, 
expressing concern about my involvement in a similar matter. I explained that I had reasons to be concerned and asked if he could assist me. Tim agreed to help, but warned of the risks, emphasizing that I should be certain. I nodded and assured him that if I had anything, I would contact him, requesting that he not discuss it, even with me. He agreed, suggesting that I do some spot checking over the next month and then get back to him. I handed him some phone numbers pulled from my wife's cell, admitting that I didn't know them and that it might be nothing, but it could also be significant. Tim acknowledged that it was a good place to start and noted that it wasn't illegal if my name was on the account, which I confirmed. Reflecting on my wife's actions, I recognized that she had underestimated my tech savviness and connections in the field. If she intended to cheat, her chances of escaping were slim unless she could completely allay my suspicions. It seemed like a precarious strategy, but perhaps her only option. Life settled at home with content kids, a happy Veronica, and me feigning happiness. A week later, Tim asked for a meeting at our usual spot and disclosed that he had checked out the numbers, obtained addresses, and caught Veronica at two of them on successive days with pictures, film, and audio evidence. I was informed that my wife was definitely cheating on me, to which I responded nonchalantly, requesting more evidence, especially additional film, as I had plans to take her down along with her lovers. Tim expressed a concern, suggesting that Veronica might be running some kind of sting, but I assured him that I wouldn't be using the gathered evidence in court and had another purpose in mind. Tim, enjoying the espionage aspect, agreed to get more evidence. After three weeks, armed with extensive information about the individuals involved, I marveled at the depth of Tim's investigation. It was now a matter of choosing the right time and battleground. I needed to speak with Bobby, and together, we watched the gathered evidence in her office. My sister expressed disbelief and irritation, acknowledging that Veronica had even fooled her. Reflecting on the situation, I shared my frustration about feeling deceived and getting sloppy seconds at times. Bobby advised against seeking revenge, emphasizing that it would only eat at me in the aftermath, and our kids would eventually make judgments about both of us. Despite mental torment, I acknowledged her wisdom and decided overt revenge against Veronica was off the table. However, I contemplated retaliating against her lovers, believing that if executed properly, it would make her incredibly unpopular in no time. As it turned out, she had five lovers, not six. The additional number I obtained was a wrong dial to her cell. Four of her liaisons were married, all with underage children. Two were individuals whose careers I could significantly jeopardize with minimal effort. One a state politician, the other a priest. Veronica had ventured into deep trouble. The influence of a woman's closeness drive had undeniably corrupted her. My sister's choice to remain single for so long suddenly made sense. Veronica would have been better off doing the same. My primary concern was for the children of the cheaters, and of course, my own. Mine would stay with me. There would be no compromise. While Veronica would have open-ended visitation, no boyfriends would be allowed near them. Otherwise, I would grant her the house, but claim everything else. Relocating myself and the children to a lovely three-bedroom condo near their new elementary school. It was time for war. A tech-savvy friend blurred my wife's face in five damning videos and crafted copies for the wives and significant others of the five individuals. Two additional copies were sent to a carefully chosen TV station to expose the priest. I contemplated suing the culprits, but that would have left Veronica vulnerable in court, and I needed to safeguard her to some extent for the sake of my children. I was partially heeding Bobby's advice. The thought occurred to me that technology might eventually put an end to extramarital affairs. It was becoming too easy to expose these individuals. On D-Day, I went to work early, staring at my computer, set up and ready. One double-click, and four husbands would likely become ex-husbands, while another would find himself singing hymns in a remote monastery. I double-clicked. Hell would soon break loose. I smiled feeling like Joshua at the walls of Jericho, anticipating the walls tumbling down. I informed my section boss that I was taking the rest of the day off and went home. I wondered how long it would take for Veronica to receive the news, or if she would at all, just in case. I loaded one of the videos into the player and turned on the TV. One button push, and she would witness herself in provocative film clips, 
signaling the end of many things, including our marriage. I went upstairs for a nap and had an idea. I returned to the phone, grabbed the pad, and wrote a note. Play video. An hour later, I heard her car in the garage door. She was home, waiting at the top of the stairs, mostly out of sight. I saw her pause in front of the TV, reading the note on the tape. She approached the player and pressed start. I could sense her nervousness. Although I couldn't see the video, no more than a minute into it, she fainted. The video continued playing. I descended and turned off the machine. She regained consciousness about half an hour later. I sat on the couch, waiting for her to come too. She spotted me. She groggily asked if I hated her, to which I replied affirmatively, stating there was no chance for reconciliation. Offering her the house and allowing the kids to live with her, I asserted my ownership of everything else, stocks, bonds, savings. I presented the option of preserving a bit of her self-respect if she didn't fight me, but warned of ruining her if she chose to resist. Expressing remorse, Veronica explained that she felt compelled to take certain actions. Despite her apology, I deemed her actions unforgivable and warned her that the consequences had caught up with her. The Mintu was in the process of being ruined, and I advised her not to answer her cell anytime soon, anticipating she wouldn't be welcome around the kids. I informed her that I had already leased a place, and Bobby would take the children there after school. Although she would have visitation rights, I made it clear that none of her male friends were welcome. She nodded in understanding. To her credit, she hadn't started crying or making excuses. Anticipating the tears would come about two minutes after I left, I proceeded to leave. Now, all the married individuals were divorced by their wives and taken to the cleaners. The priest was reassigned, but I never found out where the pole is now. Selling used cars, maybe. Veronica still works for the dean and sees the children often. It was challenging to help them understand why mommy no longer lived with us, but somehow we got through it. Veronica occasionally dates. Some office friends may set her up, but that's just speculation. I know for a fact that the idea of promiscuity no longer appeals to her. She'll be with us at Christmas. She's still family, but she acknowledges she made a significant mistake and has the decency not to push it with me. Love making, love making, love making. It can be such a destroyer. Second story. I've been married to my wife for four years, having dated for two before getting married. Although we are still relatively new to marriage, our relationship seemed robust with no signs of trouble. Our love was genuine, and we built a foundation of trust during our courtship. I'm 30, and she's 26. The incident that exposed my wife's infidelity happened on July 4th during a party organized by her friend. Let me provide some context before discussing the incident itself. About a week before July 4th, my wife mentioned her friend's July 4th celebration, and we usually have a reliable babysitter for our three-year-old. We usually inform the sitter in advance about our babysitting needs for this specific July 4th event. My wife informed me that she had contacted the babysitter who mentioned her schedule would be packed and she couldn't make it. I was disappointed because spending time with my wife had become rarer since we had our baby. Despite my reservations about her friend, my wife expressed a strong desire to attend the event and suggested I stay home with our child while she goes to her friend's party. Wanting her to have fun, I agreed saying, I'll take care of our child at home. Here's the twist. My wife knew I wasn't a big fan of her friend, who is still single and three years younger, a bit more carefree. I didn't want to come across as controlling, advising her to watch out for her friend, as she might not be the best influence. On the morning of July 4th, I took an unusual step and decided to call the babysitter myself. Normally, my wife handles these arrangements and I had to find the sitter's number on her phone. I thought offering the babysitter a higher hourly rate might change her mind. If it worked out, I planned to surprise my wife and let her know we could go to the event together. After all, I wanted to share the news once I had the babysitter's situation sorted out and enjoy the satisfaction of pulling off a last-minute miracle. Things started to unravel when I called the babysitter and asked her to reconsider sitting for my son that evening. Even though she had initially declined, she appeared surprised when I used the word reconsider and told me it was the first time I had asked her about that day. Her surprise caught me off guard and I inquired if she remembered my wife calling her to arrange the evening. A week earlier, 
she confirmed she hadn't received any call from my wife. I quickly improvised, telling her that my wife had actually called a family member instead. It became clear that my wife had lied for some reason, though I couldn't figure out why, causing concern. I arranged for the sitter to come to our house at 10 p.m., and my wife mentioned she would be leaving around 8 p.m. for the event. Before ending the call with the sitter, I made sure to tell her not to inform my wife about her coming over. I explained that I wanted to surprise my wife and keep the outing I had planned a secret. I almost stumbled over my words when the sitter reminded me that I had mentioned my wife's earlier attempt to secure the date and time. I managed to cover it up by saying that we both thought the date night might have been cancelled, but since she was on board, it would still be a nice surprise. As planned, my wife left around 8 p.m., I patiently waited for the sitter, who arrived on time. Once she was there, I headed to the party my wife had mentioned. Honestly, I had a suspicion that she might not show up and go somewhere else instead, but to my surprise, she was indeed at the party. Her friend greeted me upon my arrival, and seeing me there, surprised her. She quickly called my wife over. It's an understatement to say she was just shocked. Her reaction was more like utter disbelief. It had only been around three hours since my wife left home, but she already seemed quite intoxicated. Her eyes were bloodshot, and her reception towards me was chilly. She repeatedly asked why I was there and who was taking care of our child. I reassured her that I had the babysitter situation under control and she shouldn't worry. I just wanted us to enjoy the evening together and watch the fireworks display. The party, in a medium-sized setting with maybe 15, 20 people, had a noticeable gender ratio, more guys than girls, almost like a 2 to 1 ratio. We managed to move past the awkward initial interaction, but that still didn't explain why my wife had been deceptive about the outing. The event seemed to revolve around a game night with a focus on playing truth or dare games. I overheard one of the guys suggesting they get back to the game. I decided it was time to catch up on what I had missed and joined a friendly group of guys, the ones quite talkative due to the flowing drinks or their outgoing personalities. Amidst the gathering, my wife's behavior became agitated and uneasy, and she expressed her desire to leave and go home. Her sudden request to leave raised a red flag for me, suggesting that she was definitely hiding something. I assured her we could head home, but I asked for a moment to try some drinks since I had just arrived. I headed to the kitchen and struck up a conversation with one of the guys there. After introducing myself to a random guy, I inquired if he was enjoying the party. He introduced himself as well and confirmed that he was indeed having a good time. I told him I was interested in making a move on one of the girls at the party, but I wasn't sure who was available. I began pointing to the different girls one by one, and he helped me identify who was already in a relationship and who seemed open to approach. Using this approach, I eventually pointed to my wife without revealing her identity to the stranger. I then asked him what he thought about her. He mentioned that my wife was attractive, but he warned me that she was off limits because she arrived with the guy he knew as a friend. I pretended to be interested and asked him to share more details about this guy. The stranger went on to give me information about my wife's affair partner, explaining that they had met at a concert and had been involved with each other fornicatorily since then. This revelation really hit me hard. The timeline of when my wife attended the concert and met this guy matched up perfectly. This struck a chord because I was also present at that very same concert. What bothered me was the fact that I was with her most of the time during the event, except when she wanted to get some snacks and insisted on going alone. I recall that it took her an unusually long time to return with her snacks, but I brushed it off, assuming there was a long line or she needed to use the restroom. This incident occurred about a month ago, and since then, she has been frequently leaving the house and even had a trip out of town. This new revelation left me questioning everything. The stranger was boasting about my wife, as if she were some kind of prize he had won for his friend. He kept on talking, sharing a few more details. He explained that he had come to the party to pursue my wife's friend. When he described her as a free spirit, I wasn't sure if my reaction was noticeable, but I couldn't fake it anymore. Just then, my wife's friend joined the conversation, possibly realizing that my questions were leading to the truth about my wife's affair. However, it was too late, and I could tell that she was also part of the deception. 
I excused myself from the conversation but asked my wife's friend about my wife's whereabouts. She suggested checking the patio, and that's where I found my wife talking to the guy. It seemed like they were either having a heated discussion, or she was trying to convince him of something. I approached them and introduced myself to the man who was involved with my wife, but before I could say anything to him, my wife hastily pulled me away, insisting that we should leave the party. I swatted her hand away with anger and told her she could leave because I wanted to have a talk with the man. I confronted him directly, introducing myself as her husband. I asked him straightforwardly if he knew my wife was married before getting involved with her. Considering I had already discovered the truth about their relationship, I have a somewhat imposing presence that I use to my advantage in confrontations. Honestly, I wasn't looking to fight him if he genuinely didn't know she was married. My little show of subtle aggression was meant to let my wife know that I had uncovered her infidelity and to unsettle the guy a bit. I repeated my question to him, making it clear that I didn't want to ruin the party by starting a brawl, but I needed to know if he was aware of my wife's marital status before getting involved with her. My wife was getting anxious and tried to hold me back while apologizing. The guy, seeing the bottle in my hand and realizing he was cornered on the patio with no support, fell for my act and started apologizing as well. He mentioned that he didn't intend to cause any trouble and that he had only started talking to my wife without knowing she was married. I inquired about the number of times they had been together and he gave a response. I simply wished him a good night and walked away. I hopped in my car and drove back home. I told my wife that I wanted a divorce. I checked into a hotel where I'm writing down my story as a form of self-therapy. I'm feeling lost about what steps to take. This is my first experience with divorce, and I'm completely unfamiliar with co-parenting since I didn't grow up in a household like that. What I do know is that I can't bear the thought of seeing that woman, and this incident is making me physically sick.